today talk, today's talk, they all died, absented presence, they all died off and other myths about Native Americans will feature um, some of our New Hampshire tribe members and they all get into these conversations and we're really happy to have with us Svetlana, um, who is the Lana Peshikova, who is a co-founder and member of the Indigenous New Hampshire Collaborative Collective. She's also the Associated Professor of Anthropology at UNH, core faculty member for the Women's and Gender Studies and core faculty for Native Americans and Indigenous Studies minor. And she'll be moderating our session today, so I'm just gonna pass it right over to her to start. Thank you. I would like to begin with a short statement that um, we call land acknowledgement. This presentation or this conversation, this courageous conversation takes place on Ndakina, the traditional territory of the Pinnacook, Abenaki and Wabanaki peoples. We acknowledge this nation was built on stolen lands and developed with forced labor. We honor with gratitude the lands fauna and human beings who have stewarded this lands over countless generations. I'm not, this, this, this area is not my ancestral homeland. My ancestral homeland is in the Caucasus in the southern part of Russia, but I am a Portsmouth uh, resident right now and my family is growing here. So I, I feel like I need to recognize the, 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 the so as New Hampshire approaches the 400th anniversary of the European colonial settlement in this part of North America, we remain to a large extent uninformed about indigenous heritage, which in many cases is intentionally erased. We don't have delimited reservations uh, and we have a statewide, let's just agree, statewide obsession with the remote settler colonial past. Small tokens of recognition of indigenous heritage in the state are often limited to a fossilized and stereotypical image of the quote unquote vanishing Indians, quote unquote paleo Indians, and quote unquote Indians at the time of contact. Um, and we could see that at the local libraries and historical societies. Arrowheads is often as close as we get to indigenous heritage, unfortunately. Our landscapes are dotted with inaccurate historical markers, while our educational curricula are almost completely silent about local indigenous reality after, after the early colonial period. Including Native Americans' resistance and adaptation to dominant settler colonial cultures in the 20th and 21st centuries, and current indigenous folks to the well-being of this Greenwich state. The indigenous members of our community are still here in their ancestral homelands, but as if hide in plain sight. Their daily lives and appearances do not correspond with the Hollywood reproduced popular Western stereotypes of American Indians. As Paul Pulio reminded me in 2019, we were not all killed off by disease and warfare, and we did not disappear with the colonization of this country. We became the individual fibers in a social tapestry of the United States of C and Canada. We are among you, working beside you in all walks of life, Unless we told you who we were, you would probably never know us. So let me introduce the participants of this difficult conversation, who, like other indigenous folks, are an integral part of our local communities and the United States. They highlight an ongoing indigenous survivance and exemplify the ongoing vibrant activism of indigenous peoples in the United States in general and in the Granite State in particular. I would like to point out that the participants are a diverse group of people not representing any one particular tribe. So we're gonna start with Anne Jennison, who is online with us. We cannot see Anne. It would be nice to see Anne on the screen. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. We're gonna start with Anne Jennison. She's a traditional Native American storyteller and a historian with master's degrees in both storytelling and history. Anne is listed uh, on the New Hampshire traditional artist roster as a traditional Native American 
um, storyteller and craftsperson. Additionally, she is the current chair of the New Hampshire Commission on Native American Affairs. She's also a member of Indigenous New Hampshire Collaborative Collective, an affiliate faculty member for the University of New Hampshire Native American Indigenous Studies minor and co-creator of the People of the Donland interpretive exhibit about the Abenaki, Wabanaki peoples at Strawberry Bank Museum in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. We are doing something right in New Hampshire, right? in Portsmouth particularly. Kathleen Blake, Kathleen Blake, is another participant in our courageous conversation. She is a retired educator of mixed heritage whose indigenous descent is from the Wandant or Huron, Algonquic, and Mi'kmaq peoples. She is the former chair of the New Hampshire Commission on Native American Affairs. She is currently serving as an affiliate faculty at the University of New Hampshire's Native American and Indigenous Studies minor, a board member on the racial unity team, and a member of the Dover's Racial Equity and Inclusion Committee. She is dedicated to supporting and serving the first peoples of this land. Okay, and we have three participants here in the audience of this courageous conversation. Denise Pulio is a Sagama Squaw, which means female head speaker of the Kawasak Band of the Penacook Abanaki people and traditional artist. She currently serves on the New Hampshire's Commission on Native American Affairs she is also a federal religious advisor, co-founding member of the Indigenous New Hampshire Collaborative Collective, an affiliate faculty member of the, United, of, of the uh, University of New Hampshire's Native American and Indigenous Studies minor, and a treasurer for the COAS North America and the Abenaki Nation of Vermont. Paul Pulio has been the Sagamore or chief speaker for the Kawasak Band of the Penacook and Abenaki people and president of COAS North America and the Abenaki Nation of Vermont since 1990s. Paul is an Indigenous historian, lecturer, federal religious advisor, and a co-founding member of the Indigenous New Hampshire Collaborative Collective. He also is an affiliate faculty member of the uh, University of New Hampshire Native American Indigenous, Indigenous Studies minor, um, and um, co-founding member of the New Hampshire Commission of Native American uh, Affairs. And then we have with us, the last but not least, James Edgel. He is a Mi'kmaq, Wabunaki, and Mohawk, Haudenosaunee descent, as well as Squamscott, Wabunaki, raised in Newmarket, New Hampshire. So we will begin this difficult conversation with the participants highlighting indigenous survivance and activist activism in the Granite State. And Jenison, who is the current chair of the commission, uh, uh, you, you, you are on, it's your turn. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, Lana, um, for that introduction of all of us. And I'm very honored to be here today, take part in this uh, presentation. Um, a little more about myself. I'm a mother, a grandmother, in addition to being a traditional storyteller, historian, um, and later in life, uh, in addition to being a museum interpreter and an artist, I seem to have become an activist. Uh, I think maybe this is something that, that comes to some of us when we are elders and not so distracted um, by taking care of young families. Um, I attended, by the way, I'm very excited this is taking place in the Levinson Room at the Portsmouth Library. I attended um, Portsmouth Junior High School. I graduated from Portsmouth High School a uh, long time ago. Um, and although I live on the other side of Great Bay, I still have a lot of family living in Portsmouth. So I'm really very happy to be taking part in this presentation today, um, sponsored by the New Hampshire Black Heritage Trail. Thank you. Um, I wanna talk about the ancient history of the Abenaki for a few minutes. And then I'm gonna talk about, about very uh, contemporary issues related to the Abenaki uh, and all indigenous people in the state of New Hampshire. Um, the Abenaki people and their ancestors have been here in the Northeast in New Hampshire, um, from 13,000 years ago, right up to the present day. So I'm gonna begin by showing you two maps to introduce you, first of all, to Wabanaki territory and who the Wabanaki peoples are, and then to talk a little more specifically about the ancient and continuing Abenaki presence in New Hampshire. 
Um, Dan, if you wouldn't mind putting up the Wabanaki Confederacy map, please. Uh, the next one. Thank you. Uh, Wabanaki, oh, no, nope, back to the other one. Okay, so Wabanaki territory, Wabanaki and Abenaki, just for clarity, it's, uh, it, it's really the same word. It depends on how it's transliterated. Um, it means the people of the East, the people of, of where the place where the sun rises, uh, it, it's been translated uh, often frequently as the people of the Dawn land. And this includes five tribal groups, largest, large tribal groups and you know, smaller groups within. So this includes the Penobscot people, the Passamaquoddy people, the Mi'kmaq and the Maliseet, often referred to as the Eastern Abenaki, and then the Western Abenaki peoples um, in what is now called New Hampshire, Vermont, uh, southern Maine, a tip of northern Massachusetts, and up into Canada uh, to the south bank of the St. Lawrence, uh, around about between Montreal and Quebec, and then over to the east uh, to include the Canadian Maritimes. So it's a very large area that encompasses uh, all of the Wabanaki peoples. And if we could look at the New Hampshire map now, that would be wonderful. Okay, this map, I don't expect you, and I, I please don't be frustrated, you cannot read the detail. There's a version of this map on the um, New Hampshire Collaborative Collective, Indigenous New Hampshire Collaborative Collective website, which I'm sure will be in the notes somewhere, but it's just indigenousnh.com. This is a map that was uh, created by Chester Price in 1958 and printed in the New Hampshire Archaeological um, society publication at that point. The reason that I have put it up is um, that, that I want you to see this, all those black lines all over, showing all over the map. Those are all Abenaki trails that have existed here from ancient times. And so this, to me, these trails speak to the interconnectedness of the Abenaki, Wabanaki peoples, not only amongst themselves, but with all of their relations up and down the coast, as well as inland to the west. Um, so in addition to using rivers as highways and canoes as means of transportation, these trails were used for millennia to get messages quickly from one village to another, as well as for trade and seasonal travel overland uh, within the region. Um, there's a misconception that I think this map helps to contradict that uh, that native villages were in uh, separate locations and did not interact with each other. Um, it also helps to explain the colonist uh, idea that the native people just moved constantly. We live in a very mobile society now, and it's always been that way. That's what human beings do. They move around, they interact with one another, they intermarry with one another, they trade with one another, but they have a home. And for us in Dakana, it means our homeland. That's the, the Abenaki word for this whole territory that I showed you in the larger map. Um, and you can put the map down now, Dan, if you want to. So these, these uh, trails are of particular interest, I think, nowadays because they've, been become, they've become the foundation for many of our contemporary roads and highways. If you can, you want to look at this as a gift from the indigenous peoples to you know, the contemporary people who live here today, including us. Um, and there is a, a trail that you have all, if you live in the seacoast or if you have ever visited the New Hampshire coastline, you have all visited one of the most famous trails in the Northeast, the Abenaki Trail, which is where if, if you traveled in New Hampshire from Seabrook to Portsmouth on the coast road 1A, You've been on the Abenaki Trail. It's the one that goes right along the water. Um, this is the, the trail that, for example, you know, has played a tremendous role. Uh, it went from all the way from the Canadian Maritimes or Northern Maine all the way to Boston. Um, it's the route that Samoset took, uh, traveling from Micmac territory to greet the pilgrims in 1620. You know, it's been there for a long time. That's another whole story, but it gives you a sense, I think, of the ancient roots of the Abenaki. Okay, so now to bring us up to the present day, 
want to tell you about the New Hampshire Commission on Native American Affairs. I'm like fast forwarding 13,000 years and all the way through them. Um, one of my happiest memories was the day I found out that New Hampshire had a commission on Native American Affairs. It had been in existence for several years at the time that I found out about it. Um, the commission was only established in 2010 from the, the hard work and efforts of many people, including, I believe, Paul and Denise Puglio. Um, so 12 years ago, that's just that's a blip, that's an eye blink uh, in terms of the 13,000 year presence of the Abenaki people here, but it is a significant step. Um, in terms of a uh, step forward, bringing in New Hampshire's indigenous people and their concerns a voice in our state and an awareness of the continuing Abenaki presence in New Hampshire to the general population. You know, there is a myth that Abenaki people and that indigenous people don't exist anymore. You know, there are no Indians anymore. If you read New Hampshire uh, town histories, all of them talk about the last Indian old Mary or old Joe who died away sometime in the 1800s. Um, it's just not so. There were many reasons to go underground and to be uh, protective of identity. Uh, I'm not going to go into all that here, but you will probably hear it talked about today. So through a series of events that I never saw coming, um, I became a member of the commission two and a half years ago. And last June, I was appointed the chair of the commission, which is an honor and a responsibility. Um, as it represents a very contemporary presence of Abenaki and other indigenous people in the state of New Hampshire, I wanna tell you a little bit about the commission. Um, I'm just kind of moving my own moats forward. Um, the commission was created by the New Hampshire General Assembly. Uh, it has a capacity in the RSA that we created it for 15 members four of which are appointed, one from Dartmouth and three from different de uh, departments within the state of New Hampshire, uh, transportation and uh, tourism and the Commission on the Arts. Um, there's a quorum, there are 15 members total, but a quorum of nine is required to make decisions and to call them to vote. Um, I think it's important to note that commission members are unpaid volunteers and the commission has no budget office or staff. I think that speaks uh, clearly to the, uh, the way that indigenous people are still viewed uh, with less respect than we would like in the state of New Hampshire. Um, and yet the commission is charged with acting as an advocate, not only for the Abenaki people in New Hampshire, but for all indigenous peoples who currently live in New Hampshire, regardless of their tribal heritage. Um, the commission's mandate includes helping to connect Native Americans with appropriate social services in New Hampshire um, as needed, promoting education about New Hampshire uh, Native American history and culture, acting as a conduit to connect appropriate contacts when then the Bureau of Indian Affairs, when NAGPRA issues uh, arise, that's the Native American Graves and Repatriation Act uh, that was passed in the 1990s. Um, the New Hampshire Commission is also charged with promoting Native American arts and artists, taking action regarding issues affecting the larger Native community throughout the country, as well as in New Hampshire, um, and much more. And it's set out in the RSA that created it. It's a tall order, um, and we take it seriously. However, the RSA, we are often asked about this, the RSA specifically denies the New Hampshire Commission on Native American Affairs the power to grant state recognition to Abenaki tribes in New Hampshire. Um, that power is reserved to the New Hampshire General Assembly, which currently has no law on the books to allow for a state recognition process. So we have Abenaki tribal groups in New Hampshire, but there is no way for them to be recognized or state recognized which can be a very helpful step on the way towards federal recognition. Um, why the Abenaki are not recognized in the United States, other than a couple of very specific groups along the Eastern Coast, the Eastern Abenaki, is a very long, involved story. Um, be happy to talk to you about it sometime, but not right this moment. Um, all right. So, when I do see this significant, the, the Commission on Native American Affairs is a significant step forward. It gives New Hampshire's Native American citizens a voice in our state and a forum to come together 
um, to consult about issues of Native American interest in order to plan and to take effective action steps. It does have a purpose, it does have a value, and the commission is effective. It's growing. We're only 12 years old. You know, there are growing pains involved and we're working on it. Uh, in a moment, I'm gonna turn this panel presentation back to our moderator, uh, Professor, Professor Peshkova. But I wanna take a moment first to thank again, the Brack Heritage Trail for sponsoring this uh, brave, you know, uh, bold series of panel discussions. Today, you're gonna to hear from, you know, four more indigenous presenters you were just introduced to. They're gonna share their personal, cultural, historic, social, political, experiences with you. And on behalf of all of us, I want to thank you for your interest and your active support of social justice and human rights issues that affect all of us, no matter who we are. Um, Lana, I'm turning the mic back over to you to introduce our next speaker. Thank you, everyone. Participant of this courageous conversation is Kathleen Blake. Um, she's the former chair of New Hampshire a Commission of Native American Affairs. Kathleen, are you with us? I am. Okay, good. Your turn. Thank you. Thank you, Lana. And thank you to the Black Heritage Trail for hosting us today and for inviting us to be a part of these important conversations. We're often uh, left out of many of the, the conversations. Stephen King wrote the following phrase, the truth is in the details. This statement nicely sums up the thoughts that I wish to share today. I live on Ndakina, the traditional unceded homeland of the Penacook, Abenaki and Wabanaki peoples, past and present. That phrase has been a source of controversy in some places because of the inclusion of the word unseated. What does unseated even mean? It means that this land was never relinquished by the indigenous to other people to take possession of. In other words, it was stolen. For land to be ceded, it would mean that it would be given up by its original inhabitants. Some people worry that if they say that the land is unceded, indigenous peoples might make land claims. But the truth is in the details. There has to be a valid document that proves that the land has been ceded. Whether that statement is made or not, if this land was with knowledge, consent, understanding, and free will, transferred from the indigenous to the colonizers, then there you have it, proof of the alleged truth. Could it be that there is no proof? And that is the detail that some people wish to hide. If there is valid documentation, I personally would love to see it because despite my best efforts, I have been unable to find it. The fact is, that a plethora of false narratives has been deliberately constructed throughout the recorded history of this land, all designed to make you believe that our ancestors were savages and that the colonists were bringing civilization and all things good. Many local communities, including Portsmouth and Dover, are planning their 400th celebration. But is that when people first inhabited this place? There is ample archeological evidence that our indigenous ancestors have made this place their home for, as Anne mentioned, over 13,000 years. That's right. This place was settled before 11,000 BC, according to radiocarbon dating evidence. So what we are actually celebrating is the 400th anniversary of the European invasion of Ndakina. If there is honesty in these celebrations, they must begin by recognizing the beginning of inhabitation and publicly acknowledge the 10,600 years that our indigenous ancestors lived here. I'm sorry, the 12,000 
600 years that our indigenous ancestors lived here before the arrival of Europeans. Because the fact is that for 99.97% of the time that this land has been occupied, the indigenous peoples were the only ones here. The truth is in the details. So many attempts have been made to erase the indigenous peoples from this land and from its history. Our very presence today is questioned. Governments measure blood quantum, the percentage of Native American blood that the government considers to be adequate to be called indigenous. There are federally recognized tribes that define indigeneity based upon governmental criteria. Some states have state recognized tribes upon which criteria set forth by that state decides who it will accept. In New Hampshire, as Anne mentioned, does not recognize anybody. In addition to this abomination, that is, Native Americans are the only race that has to prove anything about their race, their levels of their race to anybody. There are also people who claim to be indigenous who are not. This phenomena contributes to the genocide of an entire race and harms Native Americans by making people wonder exactly who and what is an indigenous person. So who is indigenous? There can only be one honest answer to that question, one that does not involve governmental regulations, but, but involves truth. To be truly indigenous, you must be a direct descendant of the first peoples of this land, period. It can usually be proven that a person has indigenous ancestry almost always, if that person really does. And it can also prove that they don't. There are records that show clearly indigenous heritage. No amount of governmental regulation or recognition can negate that one simple fact. Each person's unique genetic structure inherited by the combination of ancestors who came to, together to create each of us is who we as individuals are. If those of us with indigenous heritage did not have our indigenous ancestors in our lineage, we and every member of our family through all the generations between them and us simply would not and could not and never would be indigenous to this land. It's the combination of DNA. It's our blood. They, our ancestors, live on in us. The truth is in the details. Thank you. Lana, back to you. This courageous conversation. Um, uh, Paul and Denise Pulios, um, Sagamasqua and Sagamore of the Kawasak Band of Abenaki Penacook people here in the state of New Hampshire. Kwai Nidobak. Hello, friends. My name is Denise Pulio. I'm the Sagamasqua, and this is Paul Pulio, the Sagamo. We're here to talk about what we are doing today as Indigenous people to change the narrative that we have been living through for so long. So um, if you don't mind starting the slideshow. I've been told it's coming. <laughs> well, we're waiting. Well, while we're waiting, we'll just I, I talk just, to it because yeah. we have copies. I'd like to. <laughs> the slideshow can catch up. <laughs> I, I still would like to introduce. Uh, I, thank you to the uh, Black Heritage Trail of 
New Hampshire to allow us to have this voice here today. I think what we're going to see from us is uh, when we feel that uh, to have more visibility, it's not just holding social events like powwows, it's like trying to educate the people who are still here. It's not just our cultural environment of doing powwows and entertainment for you. And we really think that it's based on educating you. And uh, I think when we finally find our presentation, uh, right. we'll be talking yep. about what we do for educational initiatives and social and uh, political and environmental justice things that we do. And um, so the first slide that we'll eventually see will be um, depicting the University of New Hampshire. And the reason why we started our presentation with this slide is because we wanted to uh, show the work that we're doing in education and um, help highlight some of the programs that we're currently working um, with now within the university system. So within UNH, um, we helped establish the UNH Native American and Indigenous Studies minor in 2019. Um, we have uh, been extremely fortunate to already have um, uh, nearly a dozen graduates already, which is very impressive for a brand new minor. We're also one of the finest first minors um, to be established in approximately two years, which is incredibly fast within uh, the institutional system. Um, some of the projects that we're working on right now is establishing an indigenous garden on the campus. Um, this garden will be used not only to provide food um, for, for local pantries or students, but it will also be used as an educational mechanism to learn about indigenous ways and gardening. Uh, as well as establishing a garden, um, we're looking at all the plantings on campus. We want to replace um, you know, uh, plants that are you know, no longer participating within you know, the infrastructure of the school with edible, um, uh, edible native landscaping. Um, so plants will not only have, require less maintenance to take care of them, but they once again provide nourishment for students or whoever happens to be passing by. Uh, along with that is a UNH trail system uh, that, we're start, that we're establishing in the heart of campus. We're hoping to have signs permanently installed uh, in, by September. Um, what, we're, what we did there is we named all the uh, campus trails along the ravine area. Uh, it, which is in the heart of campus. Uh, we're also working on uh, correcting historical markers uh, within the state. Uh, there are numerous markers that depict um, inaccurate information or uh, quite frankly, misleading information in some cases. And we're addressing those markers uh, with corrected and uh, inclusive knowledge. One and another program that we have at UNH was uh, New Hampshire Coastwise. Um, what this program is, it's a uh, year-long immersive program with area, um, I'll just read my slide since y'all can't see it. <laughs> New Hampshire Coastwise, a year-long immersion program for individuals working on coastal and marine issues within the state. Designed to build new skills and stronger networks, Coastwise seeks to cultivate and engage diverse workforce to better tackle the challenges facing our coast and watersheds to support more engaged, impactful research. All right, the purpose of this program is to teach uh, developing scientists how to work with indigenous communities and how to instill some of our practices within their programs and their research. Um, the goal of this is to help create a new science, not just the Western science, not just an indigenous science, but an inclusive science that will benefit all of us. Uh, another program that we have is a, um, a dig with uh, Professor Megan Howard. Archaeology. Yeah, um, it's the Great Bay Archaeological Survey. Um, this is an uh, archaeological dig that's happening close um, to where we are. And uh, this site um, is changing the narrative of coastline history here with uh, the contact of indigenous people. Um, we have found French artifacts, we have found English artifacts, we have found indigenous artifacts. We have found seeds that we're hoping to get genetic material out of to for once definitively know exactly what types of crops we're growing here on the coast. Um, that would be uh, an amazing um, thing to happen here. Ah, hey, we're catching up. See, we did add art. <laughs> You can go back and go just go through them real quick. 
Ah, the bits. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, one more. Okay, next one. You'll find the website from the fragments. Um, Just so you, you can see that. These that... are actual photos from the dig. Um, so on the top left are a squash or a pumpkin seed. Um, we have yet to genetically determine which. Uh, on the right is uh, corn seeds. Uh, below that is a, um, a fire pit where we believe we were rendering fats. Um, so we have taken samples and we're going to be doing lipid tests. Um, so we would definitively know what um, we were rendering at the site. What's interesting about this site is when you look at the, um, the dig pits, um, you can see the generational layers of use. And we're not talking 10 or 20 years, we're talking hundreds of years of usage. Um, as you dig down through the layers, we're discovering fire pit after fire pit, each one um, coming from a different period of time. So it shows how we've continually came back and reused um, areas that people would consider forgotten or abandoned. It's, it's quite unique because the soil structure is almost uniformly very light uh, colored sand, so it's good uh, presentation. Uh, one of the other things that we've uh, been engaged with is uh, U.S. Forest. Next slide, please. I forgot we have to tell them. Oh, oh no, oh, you, you jumped, you oh, jumped. Did oh. I jump? Yeah, okay, you jumped. Oh, I'm sorry. She's still talking. <laughs> I'm still talking. All right, so this is the CARPE program, another program that we have at UNH. Um, this one uh, was just funded and we just started the courses uh, two weeks ago. Um, it's a program that was funded by the National Science Foundation. It's a five-year study. Um, we've been initially funded for the first five years. Um, that's a collaboration project between the um, SAMI in Sweden and the Inuit in Alaska. And so between the th uh, three tribal organizations, uh, we're looking at combining our indigenous knowledge and once again, to create better science, create better research, create better uh, environment and future for all of us. Next slide, please. This is a uh, project that we uh, got involved with with the US Forest Service right here in New Hampshire. The, uh, one of the things that uh, came to mind is with all the wildfires in the West, uh, a lot of indigenous practices of forest management have been neglected for, for decades. And there's always a growing concern that even our White Mountains could be subject to the same kind of devastating fires that are on the West Coast. So we've partnered with the, uh, with the Forest Service to look at different uh, indigenous uh, ways of maintaining forests, and one of them is controlled burns. To do this, we're studying particular species of trees which are pyrosensitive. Um, they, they actually need fire to propagate and to survive. And one of them is the red pine. So we're working with uh, forest management groups from the Forest Service to look at what the indigenous forests look like, how we maintained it here, and, and learn from the past so we don't have the same problems here in the East Coast that are in the West Coast. And that means more controlled burning and the removal of understory and taking a lot of the uh, devastating materials that have caused all the uh, all the fires that we've seen on the west coast it's an exciting project it's Next also slide. it's also going into other species of trees as well we've developed quite a few uh, because of these uh, large uh, spans of land we've got into a lot of uh, conservation partnerships uh, land reclamation projects of different types and uh, the protection and propagation of endangered species, much like the, uh, the black or brown ash, which is an important cultural species that's being uh, devastated by the emerald ash borer. And we're looking at all these things as protection uh, uh, motivation. Uh, sacred spaces and landscapes have always been high on our priorities to try to protect them, especially ancient burial grounds, which we occasionally find. And we're also trying to help the heritage farmers to maintain uh, farming sites that could be uh, endangered by uh, development. And we're working with a lot of groups to try to put more land into trust to protect what we consider not only heritage sites for the colonial people, but there is an intersection of these are sacred spaces to us as well. Next slide. One of the sites that we're trying to protect is actually Weir's Beach. 
All right, um, so many of you know uh, the Weirs Beach Drive-In. What many of you don't know is that it's been on the National Historic of Preservation of Spaces as an indigenous burial ground. Um, the Weirs Beach has been up for sale now for quite a few years. We as a um, tribal group, we feel it's very important to save our people, save our ancestors and to protect those graveyards. Um, the current owner is asking $4.2 million. When the site originally went on the market, it was for 900,000. Um, so you can see what's happening there. Um, so we stand fast in the protection of our land. We have requested um, the New Hampshire Preservation Alliance to list the site on one of the, as one of the seven to save in New Hampshire. And so we are asking um, pub the public to come together and help us protect this site. Uh, and because we just feel that um, it's sinful um, to build on indigenous graveyards. We wouldn't do it to colonial graveyards, so why would we do it to ours? You can see by the union leader, there was uh, the pushback is quite racially insensitive. They just listed as artifacts found on the site and they made mockery of us trying to uh, protect the site by throwing that little cartoon in the, in the press. Next slide, please. This is uh, the Nature Conservancy. We've partnered with them at Cedar Swamp Trail in Manchester. It's going to be a, uh, it's going to be a, uh, uh, ADA compliant trail. You can see in the middle picture how we've taken, they've taken the trail from a, uh, a rough and tumbled uh, high grade uh, trail system into a something that's very uh, manageable with real wheelchair or other uh, motorized uh, uh, handicapped uh, uh, mobility systems to go into it. And when it's done, it's going to be open in uh, Earth Day uh, this, this year. year. And uh, it's quite exciting. We're trying to indigenize this with narratives and other features that are going to be included in the uh, in the new parks landscape. Next slide. So as you can tell, uh, environmental justice is pretty high on our agenda. Um, and along with environmental justice, it comes with undoing a lot of um, uh, colonial mistakes that happened along the way. Um, so, uh, you know, it comes with removing invasive species, restoring our waterways, um, res uh, removing unsafe colonial dams, uh, removing coal plants and other uh, things that no longer serve a contemporary uh, purpose for our people today. Next slide. Well, this is the, uh, I am a, uh, a retiree from the, an energy company and uh, I was, my mission in my earlier life was to remove such things as these coal fired power plants. I was shocked to find out uh, that this plant in Bow, uh, the Merrimack power plant, is still there burning coal. It's almost a, it's a sinful reminder of that past that these things should have been uh, decommissioned a long time ago, but the industry has always protected themselves through our rates and everything to keep antiquated facilities like this big polluting facilities like this on the books and on the rate base because they always claim they need it for peak uh, power demand. Is this plant still in operation? This plant um, receives, um, and I'm going to use ballpark numbers, so don't quote my numbers, but they receive approximately $25 million a year in federal funding to keep the plant operational. It does not mean it's functioning. It turns on one day a year to make sure the equipment works. Um, so we're spending an awful lot of money to have a safety net that is not used. This is a common problem within in, in, in the industry uh, itself. They have a lot of capacity and they always claim that they need these peak uh, devices out there, whether it's dams or places like this, but you're paying for it. Right. Uh, they also um, wrap in the operational costs into your uh, rates. That you pay now so the 25 million is kind of a bonus to them if you know what i mean they only fire it up as needed and they always restock their coal supply which causes a lot of controversy yeah okay next slide so one of the things that we're also trying to do um, focusing on agriculture is uh, we have been working uh, with a um, actually a portsmouth um, business called uh, la vida uh, which is a um, Mexican restaurant here in Portsmouth. 
Um, they do amazing food if you happen to get over there and give them a try. Uh, we are going to be working with them this year to uh, plant six acres of indigenous corn that's going to be used for commercial purposes. Um, this, so we have met with them and we have discussed the chemistry of corn because every um, food um, requires a lot of chemistry and it's not just not picking any old corn and you know making a tortilla out of it. Um, there's sugars and starches and other uh, components that need to be taken into consideration. So we're extremely excited to have this opportunity to show that indigenous um, heirloom crops can uh, be a, a good commercial enterprise. Is, um, Next slide. Mm -hmm. When the pandemic broke out, we were, were tapped to be part of the uh, New Hampshire Public Health uh, COVID Task Force uh, group. And what we really learned very quickly, as we saw our grocery stores uh, getting thinner and thinner and supplies were running out, we realized that uh, New Hampshire was not strategically positioned to provide anything itself. Uh, we, we almost import everything into our state. Right. Uh, we, we found very quickly that we, we put too much of our basis on permaculture, grapes and maple syrup and things like that. While we allow a lot of our other um, food resources to go uh, un, unmet. I mean, we have very limited hydroponic production. We really don't have uh, uh, ground fishermen are aging out. Our fisheries are down to less than seven actual families still doing ground fishing. We don't really have any egg production at all, other than you can find raw eggs uh, in every corner or every back road on the, when you go out away from the highway, you'll find somebody having their eggs out there. But we really don't have a poultry egg production as well. And it, we started to realize there's only one real butcher in this state as well, and that's in a very limited supply. So even if you did have beef production here, you pretty much have to go into the commodities market. Right. And for those who like statistics, um, New Hampshire produces only 10% of what we consume annually. So you can imagine how much we're importing just to maintain that. Um, we are a not a, a sustainable state, and part of our mission is to help change that narrative. Next slide. Next slide. Con continue on this. Yep. We found that uh, we needed to partner with a lot of the organic farmers because we always talk about seeds and, and uh, you know, bring back heirloom uh, things, but we have to have partnerships. We need land. You need people that are out there digging the dirt and keeping this going. And we were looking at BIPOC and marginalized community farming in, in inner cities like Manchester and, and Nashua. So this is part of this whole issue of there's no food sovereignty or sustainability in New Hampshire. And we've been partnering quite a bit with uh, UNH because they have uh, the New Hampshire Food Alliance within the framework of things that are being done there. And we've partnered with quite a few international food alliances like Slow Fish, Slow Food, and uh, like the North uh, West Atlantic Marine Alliance, which supports fisheries. And that includes indigenous partners like the Wampanoags on Cape Cod and, uh, and the Penobscot and, and the Megama as well. Next slide. So now we're going to talk a little bit about some community projects that we have been working on. Um, some of you may have heard of the Hannah Dustin Monument. Some of you may know that um, it's a slightly warped tale that's being told. Um, so one of the um, focuses that we have been working on is to expand uh, and tell the true story of what happened with Hannah Dustin. Um, so we are looking at a park expansion, which includes town and state lands. Um, a new rail trail has now been purchased and the deed is in the process of being transferred over to the state. Uh, we are looking at in establishing an indigenous monument to honor those that were slaughtered there. Uh, as well as expanding with educational panels um, to help tell the story on site. Um, so there's a lot of controversy on to why we actually want to preserve this monument instead of removing it. And the simple fact remains, I cannot remove 400 years of Cotton Mather's lies off the bookshelves. This is our one opportunity to share the true story of Hannah Dustin on site so anyone who comes and visits will learn the truth and will understand that what Cotton Mather was selling was manipulation and propaganda. So we stand fast, um, not that we love Hannah, not that we love the story, but we are in love with the opportunity of correcting a false narrative. 
And so we're gonna take that opportunity when those opportunities arise. Next slide. We're gonna go into some of the political activism that we're currently involved in. And uh, obviously the Indigenous Peoples Day became a flashpoint when uh, Durham uh, adopted it first in the, uh, in the state. And uh, it, this is just a brief list. Um, this is not all the towns that have adopted Indigenous Peoples Day in the state so far, um, but this is something that we are actively working on. Uh, we ha did have uh, some bills in the legislature looking to officially change within the state, um, which were always tabled. Uh, we did not put forward a bill this year uh, because we have two other bills that we are focusing our attentions on this year. However, um, a bill has been brought forward to create Indigenous Peoples Day on August 9th. Not Columbus, but August 9th. August 9th is the UN's World Indigenous Peoples Day. So, as an unrecognized tribe protected under the UN, we can support a World Indigenous Peoples Day on August 9th. However, we do not support August 9th being Indigenous Peoples Day. We reserve that day for the second Monday in October. Next slide, please. Next slide. <laughs> this one is a, is a highly volatile one as well. Um, HB 1261 is anti-mascot legislation. Uh, you don't have to read the whole thing, but we've been advocating to get rid of mascots throughout the state. And we've had some pushback. Um, in 2002, the Department of Education did issue a memorandum to remove all mascots in school systems, but it became a political uh, firefight by local uh, people who wanted to maintain their, their, their mascots. But simple fact mains, <laughs> last year, um, our Governor Sununu um, signed into legislation uh, HB2, which uh, is the critical race theory bill. Um, I, I apologize, I don't remember the um, actual legal uh, number it became after it became H, after when it went from HB2. Um, but this bill basically states that you cannot amplify or um, disparage one race above another. Mascots do exactly that. And the indigenous mindset, you're disparaging us. You're making fun of our customs. You're making fun of the way we look. You're making fun of the way we dress. And the colonial mindset, you're elevating us because you think we're great fighters or you think we're better than the people who were here. Either way, you're violating the law. So we have put this bill forward to officially ban mascots within the state, and we look forward to your support. You want to oh, next slide, please. <laughs> this one was an interesting one. It was uh, proposed by the uh, minority speaker. Rennie Cushing, which some of you know on the coast here. Um, Rennie felt it was uh, a time that uh, the preamble to the Constitution, everything uh, about our state starts of RSA 1. And it just, it just is a boundary thing. It just talks about the boundaries of Vermont and you know, Massachusetts. Uh, Rennie Cushing wanted a statement put in there, a land stewardship statement acknowledgement that before this land became civilized and colonialized, that there were people here before. So this is what this one is. Right. And the purpose of this bill, um, once again, it reverts back to our um, celebrations here on the coast of the 400th birthday parties. Um, how can you celebrate your 400th birthday parties without acknowledging the indigenous people whose land that you took and whose villages you occupied? Your laws are based on our practices. Your hunting and fishing you know, um, laws are based on our skills. Um, so, many, so much of what is now New Hampshire has encompassed many indigenous practices and ways. Sense to uh, you know, officially. of the development of, um, next slide, please. It's important because everything, even the fishing game, have already said. You know, European uh, fishing game practices were based on royal freedom here, uh, need to be regulated in some capacity, and the state looked at how we 
how we harvested uh, the forest. So it was important. Um, so the one well before we turn it back over to dam. Um, this is a dam that we have been advocating for its removal for a long time. Uh, one, it's not financially feasible to maintain the dam. Um, two, it's on the endangered dam list um, for breaking removed. Um, the water uh, is of poor quality and uh, honestly is toxic to the flora and fauna um, that it resides in that region. Uh, the invasive species, I mean, I can go on and on and on. The town voted. To However, a petition was assigned uh, to have that vote and have the decision put on town ballot. So March 8th, we are asking you to please go in and have the dam removed. If you're from there. If you're from Durham. <laughs> <laughs> um, and next, next slide, please. It's, it's more important too that we will we'll be releasing a major uh, film just before what they call it. Um, we're finalizing uh, the arrangements now for the premiere of the film, but it will talk about the Great Bay Estuary and um, about um, the um, the issues that we have with and how we can uh, repair some of those issues. Um, so, what what the reason why you're seeing the fish weirs right now is one of the proposals that we've given to Durham um, when it comes to the removal of the dam with the original fish weir that was originally removed to install the dam. So there was history there before um, people showed up and then it was blown up. Um, we think it would be nice to replace that history uh, that was interrupted. Um, not only would uh, installing a fish weir educationally, um, because it would be one of the only fish weir weirs in the region that people would actually be able to see and learn from. Um, there are a lot of great benefits to installing and, uh, and, and lifting history that's already here in the state. Um, and with that, well, I'd just, like to say just, thank you. I'd like to say that Exeter did the same thing. They removed it. And when that was done, the, the riverbed was blasted out. So they created these, these pools where the fish would migrate through and up to. And what we're not saying is we're not going to constrain the Oyster River if we do this. We just make this more like what the fish expected. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you. Have Thanks a great day. Any. Thank you, Paul and Denise. We have some sound issues, so please be patient with us. <laughs> Was good? Okay. Uh, per per participant of this courageous conversation, conversation is James Ad Mick Wabanaki and the Mohawk Haudenosaunee as well as Quamscott Wabanaki raised in New Market, New Hampshire. James. Gwe, as we say in um, uh, Wabanaki or Seiko, is hello in Mohawk. Um, pull up the slides as well, and I do have a video. Um, I was raised in New Market, New Hampshire, and a quick story for you all. I'm running around as, as a little kid in New Market, and uh, it comes up to me. That's your, that's your family. You got, you'd be proud of that. That's been in your, your family for, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years. And, I, I, I remember because we were down by the Lamprey River and I'm, I'm looking over at it and I'm thinking of my Uncle Wolford chick and, you know, and I'm looking at it and I'm like, oh, it's pretty cool, you know. Um, this is uh, Chick's Weir. Um, if you go down to Newmarket along the Lamprey River, you can see it, it's still there today. And, um, you know, partnership and uh, across the board in, you know, in creating really the name New Market and, and in the local, in New Market, in the town, in the local community, 
it's really taught of more of the integration of the weirs of creating this new market. Um, that's that's all that really remains um, as far as a when you're really looking at you know a, a weir is a new a weir is a new market you know you can really picture and I picture in my mind really going all over the you know the state all around the bay really seeing these weirs everywhere and we can go through some more of the slides um, And how important it was to the ecosystem for, for fish, lobster, crab, um, and, and really the survival and in and, and, and that sharing of foods, products. When I often, you know, uh, talk to, to fellow Mi'kmaqs, you know, we refer to the Mi'kmaq reservations up in Canada as really the first trading, trading post. But that was really all through, to, you know, all through up and down the coast. You know, and when Paul talks about one, you know, Route One A going up the coast, it was really a, a, an, an open trading post. Hey, can you ready to move the slide? If, if oh, please uh, advance. Next slide, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. So that's kind of a look at right now in in the um, winter. It obviously gets pulled out of the water. Uh, the Lamprey River. This is down past the falls. Um, it freezes up, obviously, this time of year. And back in, in the spring, the weirs will go in. It is maintained. So any, any, any fish in, that go in there and aqua life um, gets taken out. And, um, you know, it's, um, it's pretty cool. Next slide. And that's looking up the Lamprey River. You can see the mills up there. Um, and next slide. And then um, I wanted to get a close up so you could really see it. Next slide. And then that's probably going to be the um, video coming up. So you can really, I often picture in my mind, you know, the, the when you when you look back, you know, the waterways being full of canoes and 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 out harvesting and in the in the building and foundation and so much. Of, of Turtle Island in the foundation of Turtle Island, which we, which we call uh, America, um, is really built off that foundation. And a, a lot of this, obviously, local and town people recognize. Um, and, and, and even on the government level, uh, indigenous people is recognized for contributions um, uh, across the nation as far as you know, government, when you look from the you know, Iroquois, forestry, um, it's so many different teachings that, in, as we go through time, really come to light more. I think um, um, we were over a few years ago at the museum in Newmarket, and it, you know I was approached, and I had my mom with me as well, which was pretty awesome. And uh, you know we're talking about keeping the keeping the chicks where in the family, uh, keeping it alive. Uh, back in uh, not about, about a decade or so ago, the fishing game kind of wanted to tear it down and, and get rid of it. Um, uh, we can play the video too. We can go to the video. Uh, I got a quick video here. I was down by the river. Yes, it, it's a fishery. So yeah, that's great. So it's an indigenous fishery. Indigenous fishery, 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 fishery. Really, um, a lot of the dams have done just amazing, amazing, ama amazing damage to the ecosystem. And what a weirs does is that you're working with Mother Earth, you're working with nature, you're still harvesting, but you're still letting everything flow. Um, and you can play the video if you want. Hi, uh, uh, James Edgel here down at uh, and. Newmarket, New Hampshire. So I'm in Newmarket, New Hampshire, down at Chicks Weir. Um, the weir has been in my family for, um, since before the settlers came. So this was uh, indigenous fishing weir that um, really formed a lot across Turtle Island as far as um, really a new market. So it still is here today and 
The, up right here, you're looking at the Lamprey River in Newmarket heading up past the back of the mills and then heading down the other direction, um, the Lamprey River here in Newmarket goes out to Great Bay. And really before, you know, they, they put in the, the dams and the waterfalls and et cetera, these fishing weirs were, um, were essential for food and survival. So it was held in such esteem that it's, uh, as you can see, the chicks weir is uh, still here today. And they came up, and uh, when the settlers uh, settled here in Newmarket with the local Wabanaki tribes, um, and Swamp Squat in particularly for here, they, um, they saw a great value in the environment, in the market, and in food. And they decided, hey, you know, this is of such value that they would keep it. So it's been in my family since... Um, you know the uh, Europeans uh, before the Europeans arrived and it's still here today so my uncle uh, Wolford Chick and um, up through the Swamp Scott side um, through the dew sets as well and um, here's a park down here they built a nice little park down here uh, in Newmarket right along the the stream and heading down into the Lamprey River but I wanted to uh, showcase this for you and so you can, if you ever want to come down and really take a look yourself, um, this is really a, 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 a method that's really coming back. Um, it, it's a tradition that's uh, stood the test of time and in a lot of ventures where they're tearing down dams and, and waterfalls and et cetera, they're actually, uh, there's places that are looking to go back more to having the weirs. So right now you can see the Lamprey River is, is pretty frozen. So the weirs comes out in the wintertime. And um, right down off of here, it'll be, it'll be put right back in in the spring. And um, is used for catching, obviously, lamprey eels, uh, lobster, uh, crab, uh, fish. Um, all kinds of um, uh, Great Bay um, water life. So this is uh, this is it. It's what I want to show you. I don't want to I don't want to make it too long. Um, but James Edgel here down in Newmarket uh, showing you the uh, weirs, uh, chicks weir, and uh, you know I hope you get a chance to come down and and see it and have a little more understanding of the uh, indigenous people, you know, we're here, you know, we're still here in the state. Um, and, you know, for that to be recognized and in that relationship, this stands as a collaboration of a, of a new market of, you know, uh, settlers and indigenous peoples uh, sharing gifts and working together um, throughout history in so many ways of the formation of what the country is today and democracy is um, uh, these so gifts are ways, becoming really, more, people um, are becoming really even more aware of them the as the opposed to being able to work together a lot that, of you know, the we're all children of Mother Earth. There's so, you know, many, there's so many weirs and, and local there, tribal there, people there were really held a lot traditions. within the local community. And that's kind of where I was going it's something with, that, with this, you know, that so many local communities you know, know who indigenous peoples are in the towns. There's all these teachings that just, you know, are not taught in mainstream education, um, you know, which was, you know, a government uh, initiative not to do. And my feedback from so many people and when we were over in Newmarket is really so many people uh, feel cheated. They feel cheated. They came up and said, I really feel cheated that we weren't able to get this kind of education and this knowledge and in, um, in, in mainstream schools. But that's it. I won't go on too much longer. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Th th thank you, James. I remember that moment when uh, when a 19 year old participant said that, that that she felt cheated. Um, okay, so we're going to move on to the uh, some Q and A conversation reflection. Uh, there uh, seems to be three major topics. One is indigenous history, heritage, including recognition. The second one, structural lateral violence and lack of visibility. And the third one are contemporary critical issues, including 400 celebration on the seacoast. Now we're going to be taking questions from the audience. Um, Gina, 
um, if we have any questions online. Um, and, and Michelle will help me to facilitate that. Thank yeah. you. Hi, we will try and hopefully get a couple of questions in the room and a few from um, from online and uh, just encourage folks to um, you know raise your hand, let me know if you have a, a, a question or um, to, to ask. So I'll take the first one um, from chat. Um, do your tribes have membership policies? including for those whose ancestors intermarried with Africans. Do your tribes have membership policies, including for those whose ancestors intermarried with Africans? Am I on? Okay. Seems like it's pretty quiet. Louder, yeah. Okay. Can you see, hear me? Uh, our tribe is based on uh, lineal descent, which requires genealogy. Uh, that's the primary objective is to find out the family connections through genealogy and it's lineal descent. It's not on blood quantum because that's like a divisive uh, construct from, uh, it seems like it's not coming forward. I don't know if this is even on. Hello? Yeah, it's not coming out. Okay. Yeah, so lineal descent is based on genealogy, and that's primarily how we operate. We don't believe in blood quantum. To answer your question about uh, uh, intermarriages with other races, uh, we very clearly, we have a narrative in our oral traditions about two Africans who were on Hunt slave ship off of Portsmouth that had jumped ship with two of our indigenous people that were taken captive either in, in Massachusetts or along the coast. And all four escaped, and they became the uh, traditional family lines of Sabatis, which was Sebastian, or Saint Sebastian, and Placois, which was Saint Francis. Um, both of them were baptized. They, they made from, from Portsmouth all the way to Odenac, or the Saint Francis village in Canada. They were baptized by the uh, French Jesuits. And they created two family lines, Placois being one and uh, Sabatis was the other. The Sabatis pops up in history in Gilmanton, and uh, the other one was uh, dispatched in some militia uh, campaign to destroy uh, Abnaki. So we do have an intersection of two races in our tribe in particular. It was noted with the, uh, we did a oral testimony with the Mashantuck at Pequot because they were very interested in the intersection of uh, race. Um, and we followed this family through the whaling trade and some members of their family got into the maritime and became uh, uh, located on Bermuda. So there was a, an interesting history about this, but we still have this family still living here in New Hampshire and they're proud of the heritage of being Abnaki, but not necessarily by the original blood, but later on. Okay. Does that answer the question? Great, thank you. Thank you. And I'll be scanning the room and ask one more. I'm going to come to you. Um, what history of indigenous presence on the Isle of Shoals could you share? What history of indigenous presence on the Isle of Shoals can you share? Uh, uh, That's a presentation within itself, honestly. Um, so I, instead of butchering the question, um, I just say reach out to us and we can have a longer conversation about that. Great. But we have been working with the Isles of Shoals. Uh, to help put the indigenous presence um, uh, on the island with um, uh, descriptive panels and other resources. Uh, there are artifacts that have been found on the island, but once again, um, it's not a, it's a so much. much greater subject. Yeah, thank yes, you. And, and in 2014, we did find another artifact uh, out there, so, okay. Hello there. I wanna thank you all for this wonderful presentation. Um, I'd like to ask Denise and Paul Puglio, thank you again for being here. You talked about not having state recognition. What will it take to get you state recognition and what will that bring? Thank you. Uh, so um, we are um, one of the few tribes that have petitioned for federal recognition here in the state. Um, so state recognition for us uh, would give um, just that much more of an edge on our federal petition. But above and beyond that, um, it would take getting all 400 legislators to actually agree. 
Um, and as you can hear by the chuckles in the room, <laughs> uh, that could be a difficult thing. Um, but if both sides, or uh, actually all three sides of the aisle at this juncture, um, can come together um, and come to a, you know, a, a decision and actually come to a, a process that, yeah, we would be interested in having those conversations. But we would also encourage the legislature to stay true to the federal process. Um, genealogy is required. We do recognize some states have recognized tribes with questionable genealogical practices. We do not want New Hampshire to be one of those questionable states. So we would encourage New Hampshire um, to um, relatively follow the federal guidelines, but we could have greater discussions about that in the future. Thank you. We, we still Thank want you. To, we still want to foster the partnership relationship. If we can't get actual acknowledgement, we'd like to be a com community player, just like anybody else in the BIPOC community. So our stress is really to be community players and community uplifters, not necessarily looking for what we can get out of it by having our own sovereignty acknowledged. So mm. with that being said, we'd rather be community builders. Oh. Yeah, uh, people are saying that, that you, uh, next question and speak louder, speak louder. Thank you. What is the difference between state recognition and federal recognition? The, o the only party that can actually recognize or acknowledge a tribe is the federal Congress. Anything else is a halfway measure. This was set up in law by the United States government. You have state <clears throat> sovereignty issues, but it doesn't have the weight of uh, the fact that only the federal government can acknowledge or terminate a tribal entity in this country. That's why we haven't pushed the issue in the state, because we recognize the federal laws are very dis you know, distinct in what um, they state. Um, so um, I, you know, that's why we never pushed it here in New Hampshire, and that's why we filed for BIA recognition. And it takes a lot of lobbying, millions and millions of dollars to lobby for federal Congress to get this through. So the, the, the next, ne next question. And uh, our participants who are on Zoom too, you know, feel free to uh, contribute to add to the answers. Thank you. So I realize that fact is a huge component of truth um, and truth is phase one to truth and reconciliation. But I kind of want to shift the conversation for one moment and ask about skills because it is the job of the settler colonist to undo the systemic racism that we built. What skills would you say, and this is for any panelist, are at the top of the list that we can learn on our own so that we're doing that lifting? Maybe a panelist on Zoom wanna take that question? Kathleen, Anne? I, I will yourself. say something. Unmute yourself. Unmute. I'm unmuted. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you? Okay. okay. Um, so if one way that um, it would be really helpful to have partnership is with the, the efforts that we've put forth. Um, for example, the mascot bill right now, um, we've tried two different years to have the state recognize Indigenous Peoples Day, not Columbus Day, not due to any kind of, um, of ill feelings about the Italian people, but because Christopher Columbus never landed on the continental United States and brought slavery um, of indigenous peoples to our lands. So um, if your support would be greatly appreciated in, in efforts like that. And um, if, you, if you go on the indigenous New Hampshire collaborative collective website, we often have postings about things going on that we could use your support with and also on Facebook um, and, you know, we, we'd like to all work together to get things done and to, to partner with everybody. You, you know, there's too much divis division right now as it is. We're all members of this place right now. 
So your, your support in efforts like that would be greatly appreciated. And I'd have to think further on that question to say anything more. Ann, did you want to say anything? I don't know. It's an interesting, the way you have posed the question is about what skills, um, not necessarily what actions. And so I'm sitting here trying to decide what kind of skills. Um, certainly an open mind, an open heart, a willingness to learn how to listen to other people. Um, I, I think that people listen often to rebut, to overcome, uh, to answer, rather than listening to absorb and, um, and take in and truly uh, consider the information that's being presented. Um, but beyond that phase, then there is the interacting with other people, you know, consulting with people on issues. There's informing yourself and, um, and, and then taking whatever action speaks to you uh, the most. We cannot do it all alone, you know. There'd only be one of us if we could do it all by ourselves. We can't. It takes an, it, the action of an entire community. I'm sure all of you are aware of that or you wouldn't be here today in person or online. And that in itself is, is much appreciated. Um, I'm gonna have to think about the skills thing, but I really do think listening and listening to learn and to not object or overcome or to make one's own point um, is very important skill to learn. I um, wish we would have more time. Yeah, I'll, I'll just do some quick. Uh, Lester Cuff, uh, I am a tribal member to the uh, Nanakoka Lenny Lenape tribe in New Jersey. And uh, uh, what I what I kind of brought just to share is a book from Amy Hill Hearth. I don't know if you've heard of her. She's the author of the uh, uh, Having Our Story, the, 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 Delaney, the Delaney Sisters, the hundred year old type of thing. And in 2004, uh, she was doing her ancestry, and what her father had found was that um, 12 generations back, there was a, a woman, a, a Native American, uh, belonging to a Lenape Lenape tribe. And so she became interested in trying to follow that out, uh, the history of that woman named Mary type of thing. So what she did, she started researching the Lenape uh, in New Jersey, and she came upon our tribe down in southern New Jersey. And she spent a lot of time uh, with them, first kind of getting in, beating the tribe, and then taping. And she recorded uh, uh, one of the elders, uh, which was, her name was uh, Strong Medicine, and her uh, regular name was uh, Marion. Um, okay. And uh, so the, in this book here, it, it kind of talks about like the Lenny and Lenape were the first to sign a treaty with the US government and they dealt with the George Washington, et cetera, this and that. And they had a territory from like New York all the way down to like uh, uh, Chesapeake Bay, this and that. And yeah. the interesting thing about the book is she uh, uh, was interviewing one of the, uh, the senior ladies, she was 85, so she was kind of talking about how it was to be uh, a, a combination of black, the, white, and, and uh, uh, the, Indian. Yeah, this is wonderful. We'll put that on the list of resources that we will distribute um, uh, okay. online. We have one more question here. I just have one question. Are you allowed, those speakers today, are you allowed to go in a classroom and teach history? Like the restrictions that we have now in New Hampshire and many states in our country, that you cannot talk about racial justice and racial history. So are you able to go in the classroom and work with our students today? Yes. Coll uh, high school, college, you are. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've gone in and been invited at the University of New Hampshire, um, going to over to... And I've gone in and, and talked about the culture and tradition okay. um, with classroom. The last time I was in, um, I usually speak uh, pretty much every year over at Paul College and the, you know, the students made me some cornbread and, um, but we're very grateful. And, and I think the, the consensus, it's great when you educate young people because their generation and the way they see things um, in the generation today, um, it, it's pretty dynamic. It's very dynamic. 
and it's great to be able to educate them and get them thinking and and that's the big thing you know for takeaways from from this session is you you all have great power and and being able to think and be able to seek out the truth and be able to learn and, and listen and grow but yes you know we are as to be able to go in as a guest speaker and be able to um, educate and then I, and I know they do a ton of it you we know, do a lot of um, in classroom presentations um, we guest speak at numerous colleges around um, the you know around New England um, we're speaking at a conference at Brown University come April um, so we you know we've been in elementary schools middle schools um, colleges uh, in, in museums, historical societies, you name it. It's about getting the education out there and about um, uplifting indigenous voices. Yes, well, um, uh, Anne and, and Kathleen, do you want to add anything or we'll move to another question? No. I've been okay. just trying to decide whether or not that particular <laughs> law has affected me as a storyteller. And well, I don't think it has. She is. Oh. Because and, Anne's a storyteller, so there's a lot yes. of education there going throughout yeah. educational systems as well. We've all been into schools, I think, to, yeah. to work with children. Anne and I are retired educators, so we have a lifetime in with um, educating children. The last, the last, last word. word. Okay, well, we should wrap up because this is really the end of our difficult conversation. I think an important lesson is to listen to each other, spend time with each other, um, and tea talks is one of those places, but I'm gonna let uh, Paul and Denise finish with the last word and thank you from my perspective, thank you all for coming because you, you know, ignorance and arrogance are two things that we all need to address in our lives. Now, I know, I know there are two slides we gave to the Black Heritage Trail, what you can do. I don't know where those slides are, but uh, maybe they could find those slides and it gives you a list of things that you could do to support us. And uh, I could just summarize it really quick. It's educate the public that we're still here. We didn't disappear. We're not the past tense. We're not dead. We weren't killed off. We were still here. And hopefully they can find those slides. So we have a, yes, we, we will provide, um, we have a closing word. Yeah. Um, so in closing, I would suggest that you reach out to, um, you can reach out to us um, as individuals, or you can find us at indigenousnh.com. Um, you can send a message to the website and you'll be able to reach all of us who are on the panel here today. Um, on the website, you'll also find a lot of information about things that are happening within the state, that have happened within our indigenous community, as well as skills that you can offer to help us decolonialize our narrative. We're always looking for researchers, you know, movie makers, you know, developers, you name it. There are skill sets that we're always searching for. So please reach out and we'll be happy um, to welcome you into our fold. Thank you. Um, would you like to introduce the speaker? No, I can you, introduce you myself. Just, okay. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for your participation. Uh, and I'm grateful. Um, this is not history that I knew, so thank you. Um, it's imp one might ask the question, why would the Black Heritage Trail be interested in speaking about uh, Native, Native histories? My personal experience is that you cannot begin to talk about histories that have not been exposed. exposed. You cannot talk about hidden histories. You cannot begin to uncover them without recognizing what else is there. And uh, the absence of history of Native peoples in our nation is a sin that we are in part correcting by giving this attention today. So I'm grateful to you for that. I'm grateful to all of you for coming. Um, the Black Heritage Trail uh, functions in order to elevate these histories. We are very, very ably led by Jerry Ann Bogus, who conceives of these programs. <laughs> It's no small thing to pull, to pull together uh, an interesting, challenging, compelling panel, and to do a number of them uh, every year is really no small thing. So we're very grateful to you, Jerry Ann, for both what you give us an opportunity to learn, uh, for the positive image it gives of the Black Heritage Trail, that's for sure, but more that it helps to build community. 
uh, when we come together and we hear each other's stories, when we are humble enough uh, to, uh, to sit back and to say, maybe I don't know it all, and humility is so important, then we do much to, to strengthen community and to help us to really truly be a community, which is more than just a notion. Uh, I don't, Jerry Ann, was there something else that I was supposed to do right now? Oh, next week. <laughs> I look, the tea talks continue. Our next tea talk will explore the, the idea of the model minority. We're going to be looking at Asian Americans, Asians in America, the model minority. So please, we encourage you to come back next week. The program will not be here, but it'll be at the high school. Is that correct? At the middle school, at the Portsmouth Middle School. Next door, right there. Thank you all again for coming, and we look forward to seeing you next week.